Hey y'all, you know what time it is? Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! We are back, happy people. We are back on my favorite day of the week, which is Wednesday. And everybody knows me well enough, knows the story as to why, because ever since I was a child, something good always happens to me on Wednesdays, ever since I can remember. Um, and I'm always grateful for Wednesdays. It's the perfect day because it's right in the middle of your week. It's like two days to Friday. Wednesday is a perfect balance. Plus, I was born on a Wednesday. Fun fact. And yeah, I love Wednesdays. Partially because of Winnie the Pooh. Because they made a funny song about blustery days. A Wednesday. It feels like a rather blustery day today. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine, my neighbor? Hope everybody's having a good night. I do not own the music that we are listening to in the background because we are keeping it classical for a while. Haven't done classical music on Storytime. We're bringing it back. It helps with brain function. Um, yes, Schubert is what we are listening to tonight. And my tiny friend, Archimedes, ready to go. <clears throat> Without further ado, we will continue our journey through the story of Howl's Moving Castle. Chapter 6, in which Howl expresses his feelings with gle green slime. Howl did not go out that day, nor for the next few days. Sophie sat quietly in the chair by the hearth, keeping out of his way and thinking. She saw that as much as Hal deserved it, she had been taking out her feelings on the castle when she was really angry with the Witch of the Waste, and she was a little upset at the thought that she was here on false pretenses. Hal might think Calsifer liked her, but Sophie knew Calsifer had simply sized, seized on the chance to make a bargain with her. Sophie rather thought she had let Calsifer down. This state of mind did not last. Sophie discovered a pile of Michael's clothes that needed mending. She fetched out thimble, scissors, and thread from her sewing pocket and set to work. By that evening, she was cheerful enough to join in Calcifer's silly little songs about saucepans. Happy in your work, Hal said sarcastically. I need more to do, Sophie said. My old suit needs mending, if you have to feel busy, said Hal. This seemed to mean that Hal was no longer annoyed. Sophie was relieved. She had been almost frightened that morning. It was clear Hal had not yet caught the girl he was after. Sophie listened to Michael asking rather obvious questions about it and Hal slithering neatly out of answering any of them. He is a slitherer outer, Sophie murmured to a pair of Michael's socks. Can't face his own wickedness. She watched Hal being restlessly busy in order to hide his discontent. That was something Sophie understood rather well. At that bench, Hal worked a great deal harder and faster than Michael, putting spells together in an expert but slapdash way. From the look on Michael's face, most of the spells were both unusual and hard to do. But Hal would leave a spell midway and dash up to his bedroom to look after something hidden, and no doubt sinister going on up there, and then shortly race out into the yard to tinker with a large spell out there. Sophie opened the door a crack and was rather amazed to see the elegant wizard kneeling in the mud with his long sleeves tied together behind his neck to keep them out of the way while he carefully heaved a tangle of greasy metal into a special framework of some kind. That spell was for the king. Another overdressed and sentient messenger arrived with a letter and a long, long speech in which he wondered if Hal could possibly spare time, no doubt valuably employed in other ways, to bend his powerful and ingenious mind to a small problem experienced by his royal majesty. To wit, how an army might get its heavy wagons through marsh and rough ground. Hal was wonderfully polite and long-witted in reply. He said, no. But the messenger spoke for a further half hour, at the end of which he and Hal bowed to one another and Hal agreed to do the spell. This is a bit ominous, Hal said to Michael when the messenger had gone. What did Sullivan have to get himself lost in the waste for? Akeem seems to think I'll do instead. He wasn't as inventive as you by all accounts, Michael said. I'm too patient and too polite, Hal said gloomily. I should have overcharged him even more. 
Hal was equally patient and polite with customers from Port Haven, but as Michael anxiously pointed out, the trouble was that Hal did not charge these people enough. This was after Hal listened for an hour to the reasons why a seaman's wife could not pay him a penny yet, and then promised a sea captain a wind spell for almost nothing. Hal eluded Michael's arguments by giving him a magic lesson. Sophie sewed buttons on Michael's shirts and listened to Hal going through a spell with Michael. I know I'm slapdash, he was saying, but there is no need for you to copy me. Always read it through carefully first. The shape of it shall tell you a lot, whether it's self-fulfilling or self-discovery, or a simple incantation, or mixed action and speech. When you've decided that, go through again and decide what bits mean what they say and what bits are put as a puzzle. You're getting on to the more powerful kinds now. You'll find every spell of power has at least one deliberate mistake or mystery in it to prevent accidents. You have to spot those. Now take this spell. Listening to Michael's halting replies to Hal's questions and watching Hal scribble remarks on the paper with a strange everlasting quill pen, Sophie realized that she could learn a lot too. It dawned on her that if Martha could discover the spell to swap herself and Letty about at Mrs. Fairfax's, that she ought to be able to do the same here. With a bit of luck, there might be no need to rely on Calcifer. When Hal was satisfied that Michael had forgotten all about how much or little he charged people in Port Haven, he took him out into the yard to help him with the king's spell. Hmm. Ouch. I'm stuck. Pardon me. Sophie creaked to her feet and hobbled to the bench. The spell was clear enough, but Howell's scrawled remarks defeated her. I've never seen such writing, she grumbled to the human skull. Does he use a pen or a poker? She sorted eagerly through every scrap of paper on the bench and examined the powders and liquids of the crooked jars. Yes, let's admit it, she told the skull. skull. I snoop, and I have my proper reward. I can find out how to cure foul pest and abate whooping cough. Raise a wind and remove hairs from the face. If Martha had found this lot, she'd still be at Mrs. Fairfax's. Howl, it seemed to Sophie, went and examined all the things she had moved when he came in from the yard. But that seemed to be only restlessness. He seemed not to know what to do with himself after that. Sophie heard him roving up and down during the night. He was only an hour in the bathroom the next morning. He seemed not to be able to contain himself while Michael put on his best plum, plum velvet suit ready to go to the palace in Kingsbury, and the two of them wrapped the bulky spell up in golden paper. The spell must have been surprisingly light for its size. Michael could carry it on his own easily, with both his arms wrapped around it. Excuse me. Hal turned the knob over the door, read down for him, and set him out into the street among the painted houses. They're expecting it, Hal said. You should only have to wait most of the morning. Tell them a child could work it. Show them. And when you come back, I have a spell of power for you to get work on. So long! He shut the door and roved around the room again. My feet itch, he said suddenly. I'm going for a walk in the hills. Tell Michael the spell I promised us on the bench. And here's for you to keep busy with. Sophie found a gray and scarlet suit, as fancy as the blue and silver one dropped into her lap from nowhere. Hal, meanwhile, picked up his guitar from its corner, turned the doorknob green down, and stepped out among the scuddy heather above market chipping. His feet itch, grumbled Calcifer. It was a fog down in Port Haven. Calcifer was low among his logs, moving uneasily this way and that to avoid drips in the ceiling. How does he think I feel stuck in a damp grate like this? Then you'll have to give me a hint at least about how to break your contract, Sophie said, checking out the gray and scarlet suit. Goodness, you're a fine suit, even if you are a bit worn. Built to pull in the girls, aren't you? I have given you a hint, Calcifer fizzed. You'll have to give it me again. I didn't catch it, Sophie said as she laid the suit down and hobbled to the door. If I give you a hint and tell you it's a hint, it will be information, and I'm not allowed to give that. Calcifer said, where are you going? To do something I didn't dare do until they were both out. Sophie said she twisted the square knob over the door until the black blob pointed downward. Then she opened the door. There was nothing outside. 
It was neither black nor gray nor white. It was not thick or transparent. It did not move. It had no smell and no feel. When Sophie put a very cautious finger out into it, it was neither cold nor hot. It felt of nothing. It seemed utterly and completely nothing. What is this? she asked Calcifer. Calcifer was as interested as Sophie. His blue face was leaning right out of the grate to see the door. He had forgotten the fog. I don't know, he whispered. I only maintain it. All I know is that it's on the side of the castle that no one can walk around. It feels quite far away. It feels beyond the moon, said Sophie. She shut the door and turned the knob green downward. She hesitated a minute and then started to hobble to the stairs. He's locked it, said Calcifer. He told me to tell you if you try to snoop again. Oh, said Sophie. What has he got up there? I have no idea, said Calcifer. I don't know anything about upstairs. If you only knew how frustrating it is, I can't really even see outside the castle. Only enough to see what direction I'm going in. Sophie, feeling equally frustrated, sat down and began mending the gray and scarlet suit. Michael came in quite soon after that. The king saw me at once, he said. He, he looked around the room. His eyes went to the empty corner where the guitar usually stood. Oh no, he said, not the lady friend again. I thought she'd fall in love with him and it was all over days ago. What's keeping her? Cosfer fizzed wickedly. You got the signs wrong. Heartless Hal is finding this lady rather tough. He decided to leave her alone a few days to see if that would help. That's all. I wonder if you can guess who this girl he's searching for is. Bother, said Michael. That's bound to mean trouble. And here I was hoping Hal was almost sensible again. Sophie banged the suit down on her knees. Really, she said, how can you both talk like that about such utter wickedness? At least I suppose I can't blame Calcifer since he's an evil demon. But you, Michael. I don't think I'm evil, Calcifer protested. But I'm not calm about it, if that's what you think, Michael said. If you knew the trouble we've had because Hal will keep falling in love like this, which means Hal's a Pisces, just saying. Uh, we've had lawsuits and suitors with swords and mothers with rolling pins and fathers and uncles with cudgels and aunts. Aunts are terrible. They go for you with hat pins. But the worst is when the girl herself finds out where Hal lives and turns up at the door crying and miserable. Hal goes out through the back door and Calcifer and I have to deal with them all. I hate the unhappy ones, Calcifer said. They drip on me. I'd rather have them angry. Now let's get this straight, Sophie said, clenching her fists knobbly in red satin. What does Hal do to these poor females? I was told he ate their hearts and took their souls away. <laughs> Michael laughed uncomfortably. Then you must come from market chipping. <laughs> Hal sent me down there to blacken his name when we first set up the castle. I, uh, said that sort of thing. It's what aunts usually say. It's only true in a matter of speaking. Hal's very fickle, said Calcifer. He's only interested until the girl falls in love with him, and he can't be bothered with her. But he can't rest until he's made her love him, Michael said eagerly. You can't get any sense out of him until he has. I always look forward to the time when the girl falls for him. Things get better then. Until they track him down, said Calcifer. You'd think he'd have the sense to give them a false name, Sophie said scornfully. The scorn was to hide the fact that she was feeling somewhat foolish. Oh, he always does, Michael said. He loves giving false names and posing as others. He does it when, even when he's not courting girls. Haven't you noticed that he's Sorcerer Jenkin in Port Haven and Wizard Pendragon in Kingsbury, as well as Horrible Howl in the castle? Sophie had not noticed, which made her feel more foolish still, and feeling foolish made her angry. Well, I think it's wicked going around making poor girls unhappy, she said. It's heartless and pointless. He's made that way, said Calcifer. Michael pulled a three-legged stool up to the fire and sat on it while Sophie sewed. Till of her house, telling her of Hal's conquest and some of the trouble that had happened afterward. Sophie muttered at the fine suit. She still felt very foolish. So you ate hearts, did you, suit? Why do aunts put things so oddly when they talk about their nieces? Probably fancied you themselves, my good suit. How would you feel with a raging aunt after you, eh? 
As Michael told her the story of the particular aunt he had in mind, it occurred to Sophie that it was probably just as well the rumors of how they'd come to market chipping on those words. She could imagine a strong-minded girl like Letty otherwise getting very interested in Hal and ending up very unhappy. Michael had just suggested lunch, and Calcifer unusual had grown when Hal flung the door open and came in more discontented than ever. Something to eat? said Sophie. No, said Hal. Hal, hot water in the bathroom, Calcifer. He stood moodily in the bathroom door a moment. Sophie, have you tidied this shelf of spells in here by any chance? Sophie felt more foolish than ever. Nothing would have possessed her to admit that she had gone through all those packets and jars looking for pieces of girl. I haven't touched a thing, she replied virtuously as she went to get the frying pan. I hope you didn't, Michael said uneasily as the bathroom door slammed. <laughs> Rinsings and gushings came from the bathroom while Sophie fried lunch. He's using a lot of hot water, Casper said from under the pan. I think he's tinting his hair. I hope you left the hair spells alone. For a plain man with mud-colored hair, he's terribly vain about his looks. Oh, shut up, snapped Sophie. I put everything back just where I found it. She was so cross that she emptied the pan of eggs and bacon over Calcifer. Calcifer, of course, ate them with enormous enthusiasm and much flaring and gobbling. <laughs> Sophie fried more over the spitting flames. She and Michael ate them. They were clearing away, and Calcifer was running his blue tongue round his purple lips, when the bathroom door crashed open, Hal shout out, wailing with despair. Look at this! He shouted, look at it! What has that one woman force of chaos done to these spells? Sophie and Michael whirled around and looked at Hal. His hair was wet, but apart from that, neither of them could see that it looked very different. If you mean me, Sophie began, I do mean you! Look! Look! Sophie Hal shrieked. He sat down with a thump on the three-legged stool and jabbed at his wet head with his fingers. Look! Sir May! It's Mick! My hair is ruined! I look like a pan of bacon and eggs! Michael and Sophie bent nervously over Hal's head. It seemed the usual flaxen color right to the roots. The only difference might have been a slight, very slight trace of red. Sophie found that agreeable. It reminded her a little of the color of her own hair should have been. I think it's very nice, she said. Nice? screamed Hal. You would! You did it on purpose! You couldn't read something and made me miserable too! Look at it! It's ginger! I shall have to hide it until it's grown out. He spread his arms out passionately. Despair! he yelled. Anguish! Horror! Ah! The room turned dim. Huge, cloudy, human-looking shapes bellied up all four corners and advanced on Sophie and Michael. Howling as they came, the howls began as moaning horror, and they went up to despairing bellows and brays, and then up again to screams of pain and terror. Sophie pressed her hands to her ears, but the screams pressed through her hands louder and louder, more horrible every second. Casper shrank hurriedly down in the grate and flickered his way under his lowest log. Michael grabbed Sophie by her elbow and dragged her to the door. He spun the knob to blue down, kicked the door open, and got them both out into the street in Port Haven as fast as he could. The noise was almost as horrible out there. Doors were opening all down the road, and people were running out with their hands over their ears. Ought we to leave him alone in that state? Sophie quavered. Yes, said Michael, if he thinks it's your fault. Then definitely. They hurried through the town, pursued by throbbing screams. Quite a crowd came with them. In spite of the fact that the fog had now become a seeping sea drizzle, everyone made for the harbor of the sands, where the noise seemed easier to bear. The gray vastness of the sea soaked it up a little. Everyone stood in damp huddles, looking out at the misty white horizon and the dripping ropes on the moored ships, while the noise became a gigantic, heartbroken sobbing. Sophie reflected that she was seeing the sea close for the first time in her life. It was a pity that she was not enjoying it more. The sobs died away to vast, miserable sighs, and then to silence. People began cautiously to go back into the town. Some of them came tidily up, timidly up to Sophie. Tidily and timidly. Is something wrong with the poor sorcerer, Mrs. Witch? He's a little unhappy today, Michael said. Come on, I think we could risk going back now. 
As they went along the stone quay side, several sailors called out anxiously from the moored ships, wanting to know if the noise meant storms or bad luck. Not at all, Sophie called back. It's all over now. But it was not. They came back to the wizard's house, which was an ordinary crooked little building from the outside that Sophie would not have recognized if Michael had not been with her. Michael opened the shabby little door rather cautiously. Inside, Howell was sitting on the stool. He sat in an attitude of utter despair, and he was covered all over in thick green slime. There were horrendous, dramatic, violent quantities of green slime, oodles of it. It covered Hal completely. It draped his head and shoulders in sticky dollops, heaping on his knees and hands, trickling and glops down his legs and dripping off the stool in sticky strands. It was an oozing ponds and crawling pools over most of the floor. Long fingers of it had crept into the hearth. It smelled vile. Hmm. Oh, I had a loose hair. <laughs> Save me, Cosper cried in a hoarse whisper. He was down to two desperately flickering small flames. This stuff is going to put me out! Sophie held up her skirt and marched as near as Hal as she could get, which was not very near. Stop it, she said. Stop it at once. You're behaving just like a baby. Hal did not move or answer. His face stared from beyond the slime, white and tragic and wide-eyed. What should we do? Is he dead? Michael asked, jittering beside the door. Michael was a nice boy, Sophie thought, but a bit helpless in a crisis. But of course he isn't, she said. And if it wasn't for Calcifer, he could behave like a jellied eel all day for all I care. Open the bathroom door. While Michael was working his way between the pools of slime to the bathroom, Sophie threw her apron into the hearth to stop more of the stuff getting near Calcifer and snatched up the shovel. She scooped up loads of ash and dumped them in the biggest pools of slime. It hissed violently. The room filled with steam and smelled worse than ever. Ugh, Sophie furled up her sleeves, bent her back to get a good purchase on the wizard's slimy knees, and pushed Howl, stool and all, toward the bathroom. Her feet slipped and skidded in the slime, but of course the ooziness helped the stool to move too. Michael came and pulled at Howl's slime-draped sleeves. Together they trundled him into the bathroom. There, since Hal still refused to move, they shunted him into the shower stall. Hot water, Calcifer, Sophie panted grimly. Very hot. It took an hour to wash the slime off Hal. It took Michael another hour to persuade Hal to get off the stool and into dry clothes. Luckily, the gray and scarlet suit Sophie had just been in had been draped over the back of the chair out of the way of the slime. The blue and silver suit was ruined. Sophie told Michael to put it in the bath to soak. Meanwhile, mumbling and grumbling, she fetched more hot water. She turned the doorknob green down and swept all the slime out into the moors. Castle left a trail like a snail in the heather, but it was an easy way to get rid of the slime. There were some advantages to living in a moving castle, Sophie thought as she watched the floor. She wondered if Howl's noises had been coming from the castle, too, in which case she pitied the folk of market chipping. By this time, Sophie was tired and cross. She knew the green slime was Howl's revenge on her. She was not at all prepared to be sympathetic when Michael finally led Hal forth from the bathroom, clothed in gray and scarlet, and sat him tenderly in the chair by the hearth. This was plain stupid, Casper sputtered. Were you trying to get rid of the best part of your magic or something? Hal took no notice. He just sat, looking tragic and shivering. I can't get him to speak, Michael whispered miserably. It's just a tantrum, Sophie said. Martha and Letty were good at having tantrums, too. She knew how to deal with those. On the other hand, it is quite a risk to spank a wizard for getting hysterical about his hair. Anyway, Sophie's experience told her that tantrums are seldom about the thing they appear to be about. She made Calcifer move over so that she could balance a pan of milk on the logs. When it was warm, she thrust a mug full into Hal's hands. Drink it, she said. Now what was all this fuss about? Is it this young lady you keep going to see? Hal sipped the milk dolefully. Yes, he said. I left her alone to see if that would make her remember me fondly. And she hasn't. She wasn't sure even when I last saw her. Now she tells me there's another fellow. He sounded so miserable that Sophie felt quite sorry for him. Now his hair was dry, she noticed guiltily it really was almost pink. She's the most beautiful girl there ever was in these parts, Hal went on mournfully. I love her so dearly that she scorns my deep devotion and gives sorry for another fellow. How can she of another fellow after all this attention I've given her? 
They usually get rid of the other fellows as soon as I come along. Sophie's sympathy shrank quite sharply. It occurred to her that if Hal could cover himself with green slime so easily that he could just as easily turn his hair the proper color. Then why don't you feed the girl a love potion and get it over with, she said. Oh no, said Hal. That's not playing the game. That would spoil the fun. Sophie's sympathy shrank again. A game, was it? Don't you ever give a thought for the poor girl, she snapped. Hal finished the milk, gazed into the mug with a sentimental smile. I think of her all the time, she said. Lovely, lovely Letty Hatter. You heard right. Sophie's sympathy went for good. With a sharp bang, a good deal of anxiety took its place. Oh, Martha, she thought, you have been busy, so it wasn't in anyone in Cesare's you were talking about. And that is where we'll end for tonight. Lots of love triangles. See, this is different than the movie, but it's just as great. Even better, in my opinion. Thank you all so much. See you next time.